little girl. My favorite thing to do was to listen to my grandmother's stories. My parents often worked late, so it was my grandmother who would stay with me and my sister and feed us. During meal times, we would all sit at the dining table, and I would ask my grandmother to share stories, memories from her childhood spent in Istanbul, Turkey, where I was born and raised. My grandmother had several stories on repeat, but she had this one particular that I really loved. It was about her swimming in the Bosphorus, this beautiful body of water that divides the city into two separate continents, Europe and Asia. As children, my grandmother and her siblings would jump into the water and let the stream carry them through until they would reach their friend's home, where they would leave the turquoise-colored waters to go and collect mulberries from trees from their friend's garden. This bucolic story always amazed me because it was so different from the Bosphorus I got to experience every day as a child. My Bosphorus was surrounded by gray-colored cement buildings with no green in sight. The water somewhat preserved its color, but it was too dirty to even imagine swimming in it. In fact, we had a running joke between my friends that if you ever did fall in the Bosphorus, you would probably go a third eye or lose all your hair. The chaotic, loud and metropolitan city I got to see as a child seemed worlds away from the idyllic scenes that my grandmother would describe in her stories. It was hard to believe that they were the same exact city 50 years apart. But that was almost 30 years ago. Today, the Bosphorus looks even more different. A couple of months ago, it got blanketed with a thick layer of viscous and smelly sea snot that turned the turquoise of the water into the foamy brownish color threatening the underwater marine life and the livelihood of local fishermen. Even though mucilage incidents have had happened before on this particular strait, it had never been so excessive, far-reaching, harmful, and long-lasting. The biggest reason why it was so bad this time? Well, you probably guessed it. Climate change. Unfortunately, the escalated case of massive algae blooms is n that happened in the Bosphorus is not unique to my hometown. Rising temperatures and increased pollution levels have resulted in a global surge in algae blooms in recent decades, causing a significant drop in oxygen levels in hundreds of lakes and water sources around the world. These blooms are not only harmful to the aquatic ecosystems and local economies, but they can also have a severe impact on human health. Now is probably a good time to tell you that I am not a climate change expert. But as a neuroscientist, I know that if something affects our environment, it also affects our bodies and our brains. Some of these algal blooms, for example, are known to produce neurotoxins which accumulate in the fish and other seafood that can cause neurological damage, such as amnesia, epilepsy, and even Parkinsonian and dementia-like symptoms in humans who consume the contaminated fish and water. These toxins have even been shown to cross the placenta and accumulate in the amniotic fluid, disrupting neurodevelopment in fetuses. Similarly, long-term exposure to air pollution and fine inhalable particles such as PM 2.5 have been strongly linked to increased risk for dementia and Alzheimer's. These are just some of the ways we know climate change can cause harm to our brains. But there's still so much we don't know about. Mostly because our brains are very adaptable and can mask the harm done for many, many years. For instance, the majority of people with neurodegenerative diseases such as Alzheimer's and Parkinson's don't show any behavioral physical symptoms until mid to late life, even though they may have had exposure to harmful substances or physical trauma that might have triggered their disease decades earlier. Most often, by the time patients notice their symptoms and seek neurologist help, more than half of their nerve cells have already died and their diseases are at an irreversible stage. That is why 
it is likely that we won't see the true toll of our current exposure to pollutants, heavy metals, and toxins years and years from now, when it might be too late. We are facing an epidemic of neurodegenerative diseases, let alone a pandemic of COVID-19. More than 6 million Americans today are living with Alzheimer's. This number is projected to more than double in the next 30 years. And after decades of research, we still don't have a cure or even ways to truly slow down these horrible diseases. In the next 50 years or so, we still we will not only see millions of more people with these fatal and incurable disorders, but with the effects of climate change, we will likely see them occurring at much earlier stages of life. This is a truly scary scenario for all of us. But what is really scary for me is the adverse effects of climate change on the most sensitive brains of all, the ones belonging to our children. The developing brain is a very dynamic organ. Many processes that are not inherent to the adult brain that involve neurons growing and making connections, wiring, rewiring, pruning those connections simultaneously happen in the developing brain. These simultaneous activities make them extra susceptible to being interfered with by harmful substances. Researchers have found, for example, a strong link between traffic-related air pollution and an increased risk for changes in brain development, resulting in lower IQs, poorer, uh, uh, poorer ways of doing hand and um, eye-coordinated tasks, and even neurodevelopmental disorders in children and teens. Similarly, hyperthermia caused by increased heat exposure have been shown to modify brain development and cause long-term memory and learning deficits. Some studies even predict that increasing water temperatures caused by a warming planet could result in 96% of world's population not having access to omega-3 fatty acids, which are essential to healthy brain development in fetuses, in babies and children. Even though we don't know much about the process, some of these harmful effects are thought to even be passed on from parents to their children, who may never get exposed to the harmful pollutants themselves. These are some of the things we have to really seriously consider when we are assessing the true impact of climate change on our health. We may not see the real damage for many, many years, and we may not be the only ones being affected by them. But I'm not here to scare you. I'm here to tell you that there is hope. Our brains are truly fascinating organs that can find ways to mitigate damage, given the opportunity. Our adaptable nerve cells can amend their connections and reorganize their wiring. With the same actions we take to curb climate change, to prevent air pollution, excess of heat, and exposure to harmful substances, we can prevent harm to our brains, especially to those of our children. I don't know if I will ever get to swim in the Bosphorus in my lifetime, like my grandmother did as a child. But I hope that with our actions against climate change today, we will be able to leave an idyllic enough world to our children so that they can share bucolic stories with their grandchildren one day. I believe we can make such a future happen. Thank you.